I wanted to take just a minute and introduce to you my good friend, Russ Johnson, who will be preaching for you in a couple of minutes. Um, Russ and I met uh, a few years ago. Stacy and I had recently moved to Fort Myers, Florida from Texas, and uh, I got a note on social media from a guy I had never met named Russ, and he reached out and just shared his appreciation for books that I had written and things that he had learned from me and some others and, and didn't know that I had moved into town and so asked if we could get together, which we did and quickly became good friends. Russ and I uh, are partners in crime in many different ways. We both love the same message. We love the same gospel. Uh, we found ourselves to be real theological uh, soulmates in many ways. And as you know, I am super particular about whatever message comes from behind this pulpit. I don't just select people to preach for me uh, willy-nilly. I'm very, very meticulous, and I'm very, very specific, and I'm very, very particular, and very, very picky. Um, and when I was thinking about the Sundays that I wouldn't be here, uh, Russ was at the top of the list of people that I wanted you to hear from. Now, he's different than Pat. The message is the same, but Russ won't preach for only 12 minutes like my good friend Pat Thurmer did a few weeks ago. Uh, doesn't mean he's going to preach long. It just means that it'll probably be longer than 12 minutes. But I am super excited for you to hear from my good friend Russ. So let's give Russ Johnson a warm sanctuary welcome. I want to talk to you today about, uh, about finding freedom from a very popular idea of God. Again, I want to talk to you about finding freedom from a very, very popular idea about God. I don't know all of your stories, and I'm not going to presume um, to know them. I won't bore you with all of mine. I'll just tell you that I met Jesus as a 20-year-old dude on a freight dock in the middle of the night with a guy who took the time to walk alongside of me in the Tampa area where I grew up. And my life took a significant turn. But as I plugged into what is known as the church world, what was referred to as good news didn't feel good anymore. I don't know if any of you can identify with that. What was good news just didn't seem like good news. Uh, I heard about being saved, but I never really felt safe with God. I heard that God loved me, and I read about how God loves us but I never felt like he liked me. I, um, I read in John 19 where Jesus declares that the Father's dealings with the sin problem of this world are finished. And I rejoiced. But anxiety would always take over. And it felt like he really just said, no, it's to be continued. And maybe you can identify with some of that. Maybe you resist God because you heard about a father who was just really disgruntled all the time. Someone who was kind of like an angry landlord who was always hovering at the bottom of the stairwell, just ready to hand you an eviction notice at a moment's, right, at a moment's notice. Or maybe you heard about this God that you've been resisting, um, who's like this cosmic bookkeeper, who's just ready to evict you from your place on earth at, just at any time. Because you've got a moral debt that you just can't pay no matter how hard you try. Maybe you, maybe you resist God because you've thought a lot about all the things that you've heard and you found yourself going, ah, they say he's good, but I just don't know. I just don't know. Because if he's that good, wouldn't he tell us like what score we need to get before we get out of here to assure someplace in the hereafter with him? Would he not take the time to come down and at least tell us like where we stand right now and how much time we have left to hopefully obtain the score that we need? I mean, if he's really that good, why am I wondering if he grades on a curve? Because if you throw like Queen Elizabeth in there or Billy Graham, like I'm screwed, you know? And maybe you kind of found yourself like thinking through some of these things. But after spending uh, 15 years in pastoral ministry in Asheville, North Carolina, in the big city of Chicago, and even leading in these things, 
I found myself going, man, I'm also running into a lot of people who are resisting God because they bought into the pretense of a promised transformation and a better life only to be met with missed expectations, fears, doubts, the same old challenges. And they find themselves wondering either A, does he really care? Or B, is he not moving on my, on my behalf because I'm just not doing it right? Either way, whatever camp you might find yourself in today as you're listening in from abroad or sitting here with me this morning, I want to invite you to, to look at what Jesus says about the Father many of us have secretly feared. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 18. There's a beautiful, quick, little, short parable that Jesus tells. Parables are my favorite things in, in the entire Bible. Um, they used to be a frustration to me, and sometimes they still are. But once I started to realize that, oh, these are stories about what God's like. These aren't like lessons to go do. This kind of aha went off for me. But there's this crazy little story in Luke 18 that Jesus tells, and it comes right on the heels of the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray. You guys familiar with that? So if you were to back up like in Luke 17, there's the disciples that are following Jesus. They're like, hey, uh, John's disciples have kind of gone through this like training, this spiritual formation on like how to pray. We really feel like we need some of that. Can we go ahead and press into that now? And of course, if you follow the life of Jesus, you're seeing him constantly separating himself from in a sense, almost like John's God, or John the Baptist and what he was saying, like he was definitely proclaiming the Messiah to come and point into Jesus. But John had definitely grabbed on some ideas that the Messiah was coming to make Rome sort of fall and, and the Jewish people rise up and to make the world straighten up and fly right so that God could be happy with it. He hadn't grabbed on to the idea that the Messiah was actually coming to give his life for us so that in and through his death and resurrection, we could dwell forever with him. And so they're going, hey, man, we need like some training here. And of course, I love that little story there where Jesus responds to them with a three-day prayer training. And if you're familiar with your Bible, you're going, wait a second, that, that didn't happen. No, it didn't. Jesus sort of like nonchalantly hands them three sentences on how to pray. <laughs> and then he tells a story about an improper friend. I love that. Took me, again, 15 years in ministry to see that. To go, wait a second. These guys are coming to ask for this out of, their, out of their understanding of what the Father's like. And Jesus is, in a sense, sort of like looking at them with a wink and saying, hey, guys, um, if you had a proper understanding of what my Father was like, you wouldn't be asking for a proper way to how to talk to him. If you knew him as dad, you wouldn't be asking for a blueprint for how to have a conversation. And then right after that, right after that story of an improper friend, Jesus tells the story of an unrighteous judge. In a sense, he like doubles down. He doubles down on helping them really grab onto this father that they've actually missed their whole lives. It says this in verse 1, And he told them a parable to the effect that they have to always pray and not lose heart. If you're like me, you'll read that and go, yeah, he told him this one because he was saying like, no, here's where I'm really going to double down and give you the blueprint. I'm, this is where I'm going to give you the manual. This is where you're really going to get what you need to make it happen. And he's like, no, no. You remember that person in that story, like that, that improper friend who was banging on the door for a cup of sugar at midnight? Think about that for just a second, by the way. Like I grew up in the 80s. So as a kid, it was very normal to go to the next door neighbor and say, hey, uh, my mom's out of sugar. Can I get some? Right. Um, now, of course, people like duck and hide if you even come near their front door. <laughs> it's like a whole different world <laughs> that we live in. But think about like, like the way Jesus describes us as like, me, describes the Father is like, we should be people who actually at midnight would bang on his door and ask for a cup of sugar because it's the banging on the door that he's like, okay, 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 I get it, I'll get up. You know what I mean? He tells this story. And so when he says here in verse one that he tells them this parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart, He's saying, I'm telling you this story now so that you realize that my dad is someone you can talk to all the time about anything, anything at all. R-rated prayers are actually welcomed. 
And you don't have to lose heart about this. And here's why. He says, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. She's like a modern day Karen, basically. Verse six, <laughs> or George, I guess you got to have like a guy version or something like Ken. There you go, right? Ken, we got to be alliterated. Can't be in ministry if you're not alliterated. What am I thinking? Verse six, and the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Notice it doesn't say because they cry to him day and night. But will he not give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Eight quick verses. Two characters. You guys cool if I walk through this? So this is probably one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. We got a judge. The judge has a job to enforce the law. He represents justice and righteousness and fairness. And good on this judge, because Jesus explains that this dude is a guy who doesn't, he does not, he does not make his decisions out of fear of God or man, okay? He, he, he's, he's not about that. He's black and white, straight down the line. Guilty, not guilty, period. And then Jesus talks about this widow, who in the story, I believe, represents the category of the least in society. The last, the lost, the little, the dead even be a representative of, I don't know, something like childlike. I think Jesus had something to say about that. That's who she represents. In Jesus' day, you have a patriarchal society, so a widow was at the equivalent of an orphan. When she lost her husband, she also lost her social standing within society. She, she had nothing. She brought nothing. But in this case, we don't only have a widow who's lost her place in society. There's also a flip side to this person. She's someone who won't quit. That's why I kind of laughed a minute ago and just referenced her as a modern day Karen. She won't quit. She's not going to stop. She might be in tune with the fact that she's the least, the last, the lost, the little. She might, re she might be on board when grabbing on to the, to the fact that she is desperately in need of something beyond her shore to come and save her. She has nothing from within herself to justify herself, to find her place, to belong. She might grab onto this and amen for it, but there's this flip side to this widow who even seeing that, for whatever reason, is very much determined to become a winner in this world. She's not going to accept loser status. And so she keeps coming to this, to this judge. She keeps going to this courtroom. She keeps pleading her case over and over and over and over again. Um, one of the ways to think about it is if you're familiar with the story of the, what's often taught, called the, uh, the prodigal son, okay? Another parable that Jesus told. Like the prodigal son, this younger brother who basically wishes his father dead, okay, takes half of his inheritance and goes and squanders it at the strip club and partying and hanging out in Las Vegas, winds up at the bottom of the barrel, right? Eating from a pig trough and decides, you know what? It's better back at my dad's house and he heads home. That's his story. This younger brother, like her, knows he's desperately in need of something else. He's the least, the last, the lost, the little now, just like this widow. Okay? But the difference between the two is the younger brother knew this and went home with an empty hand, where this widow refuses to do so. And I think that's a really good point in this story for us to grab onto. She's going to work this system in every way she can. But here's the thing, as you probably heard in the story, the judge won't have anything to do with it. He will not let his courtroom or his time, his calendar, get bogged down with anything that should not be within the courtroom. He will not hear her case. He will not meet her where she's at. He's not letting his courtroom get tied up in this. He either finds her case claims 
to either be um, unsubstantiated, you could say, or uh, he finds no legal fault in her adversaries. Either way, and please hear me when I say this, she can find no legal justification because her cries for justice have no merit. She can find no legal justification because her cries for justice have no merit. But then the story takes a turn. And this is where everybody in Jesus' audience was going rut row. I don't know if you guys know this, but if you follow like the timeline of Jesus or the scriptures, if you're new to this, basically the moment he declares what God's really like and who he is and why he came, every religious upright standing person on earth was basically working to plot his murder. They weren't providing a golf clap at the end of his talks. <laughs> okay. It was the opposite. So that's what I love in the story is he starts to paint this picture, but then the story takes a real turn here. And he's, again, he sets every upright person in a rage, basically. The judge, it says, has a change of heart. Notice that, has a change of heart. Not because she now has a case, because she doesn't. Nothing's changed. He doesn't have a change of heart because she now has a case. He has a change of heart, it says in the passage in verse 5, because he wants the convenience of just being done with this whole nonsense. He's tired of hearing Karen bang on the door and demand what she wants. He literally wants to be done with the whole wet blanket of this whole, this whole thing. That's what it says. He has a change of heart. If you want to back up and look at it with me. Verse 5. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, it says, keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not, <laughs> I love this, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. You see, Jesus doesn't have the problem that we often have He's not afraid. He doesn't live with the fear of putting a bad person in the place of who God is and how he's actually working in the world today. He has this, in a sense, this judge makes a shift in his whole operation. He steps from being an un upright, upstanding, black and white processor and implementer of the law. Okay, he moves from that to now making a decision in her favor based off nothing other than whim. There's no change in the case. She has no merit. And yet he chooses to step outside of the chamber. He chooses to take off the robe. He chooses to leave his business of being a judge to rule in her favor. I wrote this down. He has stepped out of the judge's chair to vindicate the widow. He has chosen to shut up about whatever is wrong to just be done with the hassle of it all. He knows that he'll be brought before the ethics board. He knows public outcry will be real and people will demand his resignation. His family reputation will be lost. This is a person that Jesus writes in this is the character that Jesus writes, it, writes into the story to represent what his dad is like and what his dad is doing. God's going to have to go slum for friends among sinners now. <laughs> but he doesn't seem to care because that's who he's got a heart for from the get-go. He has declared a verdict which has nothing to do with the righteous demands of the law and everything to do with his desire to just get everyone back to the party. Guys, would you think about that for just a second? Jesus is telling us a story about the father who's like a judge that has declared a verdict which has nothing to do with the righteous demands of the law and everything to do with his desire to just get us all back to the dance that he created us for. See, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, if you're familiar with that verse, it doesn't say that, that God has committed his love toward us and that while you and I chose to get it together, believe correctly, start saying and doing all the right things, 
Christ died for us. It doesn't say that God commended his love toward us and that while we eventually rose up and became the people that we needed to be, so much so that he would never even need to die for us to begin with, then he becomes like a papa to us. No. Romans 5 eight says that God commended his love toward me and you. God commended his love toward us and that while, capitalize that, we were, capitalize that one, still, capitalize that one, sinners. Christ died for us. Think about that. I have so much time in my past caught up in, uh, in various thoughts and fears and frustrations and doubts and worries and should haves and could haves and the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. All while operating in good faith to the wrong God. (laughs) This story, I love it because Jesus comes and meets us right where we are. He says, let me tell you what he's really like. Let me tell you what he's really done. Let me tell you now, Rust, that whether the widow mopes home disgruntled because of this how he chose to handle her case, or skips home with glee, it's irrelevant. The verdict stands. While you were still sinners, Christ died for you. He's not kidding in Ephesians 2 when he says that we were justified by what? By faith, right? Through grace. And this is a, here's my favorite word in that verse, gift. And this is a gift. Jesus, in a sense, I feel like in this story, seems to ask all of us, do you think it matters to God? Do you really think it matters to God? How just you think your cause is? Do you think it really matters to him how just you think your case is? Do you think it really matters to him how well you performed at it? Because if you want to back up and look and look at some of the other stories that Jesus tells, take the one about the lost sheep. Did the lost sheep get found because he got on the right trail? No. No, he didn't. Did the lost coin get found in that parable because it cried out to God day and night with the right prayers, unceasing? No. Coins don't pray. Sheep don't find the right paths. My grandfather raised them. When they talk about sheep being dumb, oh my land, do I have some stories for you. Sheep do anything but find the right path. Do lost sons get celebrated because they come home and they offer their fathers a great repayment plan? No, no. You see, lost sheep and lost coins and lost sons don't do anything but get lost. So thank God we serve one who's in the business of finding that which is what? Lost. His doing, not mine. Towards the end of that parable, Jesus asked this rhetorical question. (laughs) He says, will God not judge in favor of his people? Will God not judge in favor of his people? And I love the word there. It depends on what translation you have. Some say quickly, some say speedily, some say soon, soon. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you could go through, your, through the Bible and you could start piecing together different passages and trying to figure out what that means. But I'm a huge fan of taking the scriptures and look at, looking at them through the lens, through the, through, the, through the actual narrative of what they're all pointing to, which is a God who becomes flesh and dwells among us, lives a life we cannot live, dies the death we deserve to die, and brings us all home with him in his resurrection. It's all pointing to that. And so when Jesus says, so will God not not judge in a way that's for your favor? And I love that. Yeah, he will. And soon. And if you follow that story of Jesus, soon he did. Did he not? Soon he did. Speedily he did. That's what the cross is all about. It's the only place in the world where our failures are recognized and redeemed. Please hear me when I say that. It is the only place in the world where our failures are recognized and 
redeemed. That is what it means. That is what he's done. Romans 8.1 says that, therefore, there is no condemnation for what? For those who are in Christ Jesus. And I love that verse because that seems to be everything that he's pointing to in this story and exactly what he accomplishes through his death and resurrection. There will be no condemnation. And what I also love about that is, uh, is it, <laughs> it seems like God is always like in the business of, of helping different types of people see what he's really saying so they can see what he's really like. I have some, uh, some people that I've been walking alongside of for years, different people that we've been able to serve through a ministry that I lead called Lark. And uh, one of the verses that we often get to is in the book of Galatians. In Galatians 2, it talks about uh, how about, therefore we have all been crucified in Christ, it says. Therefore I no longer live, right? The Christ who lives in me. And I love that because it all points to this mystery of the cross. It all points to exactly what Jesus was saying when he said soon. That one day we would be, we'd begin to see and realize that it was in him, Christ, who is life itself that we all have always, always existed in. We just sang it a minute ago. It's your air that I what? That I breathe. The, the idea of independence, this myth that there's me and there's God. <laughs> it's, you can believe it if you like, but you're just believing a myth. We've never existed outside of him. You can't, you can't have life outside of him who is life. And so that's the story of this gospel and, and the story of his death and his resurrection, this mystery of the cross as we often refer to. And we go to that verse in Galatians and we talk about how we can, we can find rest today. We can find peace. We can find freedom. We can, we can finally just let go because there's no you to condemn. If you've been crucified in Christ and you no longer live, how can there possibly be a you to condemn? Why do we live with this fear? But what I've learned over the years is some people grab onto that mystery and other people just wrestle with it. They're like, oh, I see it in the scriptures. I know it's there. I can recite it, but I, it just, I can't find peace in it. And that to me is where this story comes in. Where Jesus looks at us and says, okay, I understand you're wrestling with the mystery. You're wrestling with the mystery that there's no you to condemn because there's no more you. The, the you that exists, exists in him now. I get it. It exists in me, you would say. Well, how about this one? How about there's no judge to condemn you? Wow. My friend Mark says it well. Turns out God is not interested in weighing what the parties in his courtroom deserve. He means to rule in their favor, no matter the cost to himself or his family. And that cost has proven quite high. God has lost the public's respect and been rejected by those more upright than him. <laughs> he has suffered great shame and wound up slumming for friends among sinners. Yet for all that, listen to this, the line outside his courthouse still stretches around the block as earnest citizens take turns making their case to an empty courtroom. The verdict is already in. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus concludes the parable and says with one last rhetorical question, nevertheless, now that you've heard all this, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I think the answer is no. What do you guys think? When we look around, right? Eh, I would say the, the world's definitely not filled with that. Uh, a world of wannabe winners are not all that stoked about grabbing onto the heels <laughs> of messiahs who come and willingly die. Unless, of course, you've gotten to the end of your virtuous rope. In which case, you'll find yourself just filled with a joy that you can't explain. But I do think this, I do think when Jesus arrives, he will find a band of misfits that have decided to take him at his word. I do. 
I think he's going to find a band of misfits that found the freedom to deem foolishness as disharmony instead of damnation. Please hear me when I say that. He's going to find a, a band of misfits that deem foolishness as disharmony instead of damnation. In other words, things that God says are good and worthy to, to pursue and to walk in, that hasn't changed. It hasn't gone anywhere. The beauty of realizing what our dad is really like and what he's really accomplished in and through his son is we get to start looking at those things not as a means to obtain and, and maintain favor with him. We get to now look at these things as a way to obtain and maintain harmony. I love the way Capon says it. We've always been free. Finding out that you've been set free by who God is and what he's done through the cross doesn't make it any more free. If you want to go stick your nose in a meat slicer, have at it. You've always been free to do so. Just doesn't mean it's not going to hurt, right? And to me, that's sort of like we're seeing what God is like and, and the fact that the courtroom's empty that goes, wow, these things that I used to be a slave to, now they just start to look a little bit more like, well, that's dumb. Why did I always do that? It's such a shift, right, in our own heart and minds. When, when we move from, man, I need to do this so that I'll be loved, to, man, I need to do this because it just sucks when I don't. I think he's going to find a band of misfits who have found the freedom to ditch the scorecard. I think that's also what happens when we start to see what our father is like. When we start to see the one who has willingly left his business as a judge to meet us where we are. And the reason why we can drop the scorecard is he's not counting, guys. He's not counting. I know everything out there in this world tells us that life is something that we achieve and then we fill in the blank by how we do so. But what I see in the scriptures is that life is really just a set of experiences that we have on this side of the veil. And it's a fraction of what it will be on the other side. We're free to ditch the scorecard. And lastly, I think we're free to drop the mask, like both of them. I know it's Florida, right? We're like, what's a mask? I had to travel to Minneapolis to speak one time. And they're like, oh, where's your mask? I'm like, I'm from Florida. We don't really do those. <laughs> they didn't think it was funny. <laughs> so, um, but on a serious note, I think when we realize what our papa's like, through a story like this, we really do get to drop the mask. He's not measuring anything. Why would we? Why would we? We could actually be people who have, we'd actually become people who have the freedom to love like we've got nothing to lose. And we got nothing to lose because we got nothing to prove. One thing that Tully and I have definitely talked a lot about over the last few years is the last thing the world needs is another Christian coming along declaring how they've climbed the rope to some, some status of being in the world or in the church, passing on to the rest of us the seven steps that we need to do to get there. Instead, we can just drop the mask and be who we are. Broken people held by God's boundless love. My prayer is that we could experience that type of a relationship. That we could that we could know that we could know that type of joy in the day in and the day out. Because he's just that good. Sometimes it just comes down to simple words like that. Because he's just that good. Would you guys pray with me?